Okay, okay so, so we have begun our final journey, our last almost month coming into Deuteronomy. We'll call this first part Review and Renewal because we have to look back on the past so we understand the present and we can see the future. I'm thankful for the uh, rear view mirror. You know, sometimes I wish I didn't have a blind spot, but Deuteronomy sort of helps us look all around what's happened. Sometimes the Bible tells us to forget the past and press on to what's ahead, Philippians 3. At the same time, we never lose sight of what God has done for us, who he is, and uh, his uh, priority in our lives. So the author of these first five books of Scripture, uh, Moses, we're on the plains of Moab. We've made that journey. It's been almost uh, 40 years now. And we just got to go across the Jordan River into uh, Jericho, into the new land. The whole book, it's a series of sermons, and we preachers like that, taking place in about a month. I call it God's Wilderness Survival Guide because when Jesus was tested and fasted for 40 days and nights in Matthew 4, there were three temptations, right? In each case, where did he pull the scripture from to answer that old devil? Deuteronomy. Man doesn't live by bread alone, but by what? Every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God, straight out of Deuteronomy. You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. It's the second one. And you shall serve the Lord your God and him only. You see, Jesus went through the wilderness in those 40 days, perhaps as a parallel to the 40 years of the Hebrews so long ago. And the book he relied on, of course, he loved all of God's word, but this is the one he used and then silenced Satan. And we can do the same thing. As Deuteronomy was so valuable to Christ, how valuable it must be to us. And then here's sort of a key, four words, listen, remember, obey, and teach. Deuteronomy 4, 9, give heed, do not forget, do not depart, and make them known. In Deuteronomy, you have kind of a systematic, you go from uh, grace, God has saved you, to faith, you want to put your trust in him. Here's the law God gives, be loyal to it, and the results, the consequences will come. Observation. Here's what we've seen. Interpretation, this is what it means. Application, this is what we do about it. One choice, Deuteronomy 6. Hear, O Israel, what? The Lord our God is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and strength. The rest of the Old Testament is really a playing out of the message of Deuteronomy. Because as the kings and the people adhere to this instruction, the nation prospers and grows and wins. But whenever they depart from this pattern, this blueprint, then they suffer and they fall. Everything is in Deuteronomy. Even predicts the time they would have a king in Deuteronomy 17. Don't let him multiply wives for himself. That's what Solomon did. Let him have his own handwritten copy of the law that he writes himself and reads, etc. And then the exile, you will disobey, Moses said, and God will banish you to a foreign land. Won't happen for a long, long time. They'll go to Babylon. But in that land, you will repent, you will cry out to God, he'll bring you home. So the entire rest of the Old Testament, as well as the promise of Christ, right here in Deuteronomy, Moses said... In Deuteronomy 18, the Lord your God will raise up a prophet for you like me. Him you shall heed in all things, and whoever does not do so will be cut off from his people. In Acts chapter 3, Peter and John, standing before the crowd after healing the crippled beggar, said Moses was talking about Jesus Christ, a prophet like him from his own people. You must submit your life to him or else you will perish. The Shema. Shema is the Hebrew word for hear. So that hear, Shema, O Israel, the greatest command. You also notice in Deuteronomy, there's a parallel with the way that covenants or treaties or contracts were made with people in ancient times. Deuteronomy doesn't copy. 
It's the inspired Word of God. The content of it is not taken from any human source, but simply the layout. Here's the preamble uh, introducing the covenant. The historical prologue. God says, I'm Yahweh, the Lord your God. This is where we've been. This is who I am. This is what I've done for you. General stipulations. Here are the commands. We'll see in Deuteronomy 5 that the Ten Commandments are repeated for this next group. And then specific stipulations. This is what I expect of you. So when Hittite kings, for example, would conquer another people, they would give them a suzerainty treaty, and they would lay out, this is who I am, this is who you are, you do this, you get that, you don't do this, you get that. Blessings and curses. And then the document clause and witnesses, very interesting. And then finally, uh, the book closes with, of course, the death of Moses. We could also look at uh, preacher's favorite, you know, three-part lesson, review, requirements, and reward. You could divide the book up that way. Again, this is our history. This is what we need right now. And this is what's coming in the future. There are dangers in Deuteronomy that we face today, the dangers of abundance. You know, we're overly blessed. We might take our eyes off of God and begin to look at material things and stuff and money and what we own and what we control and what we have in our pockets and in our hands. The danger of complacency. We've, we're saved. We've been Christians, many of us, a long, long time. Isn't it good just to kind of go along and everything's fine? We trust God. We love God. We serve God. We need the fire. We need the vigor. We need that initial. I've been saved. God brought me out of bondage. He took Pharaoh out and set me in this new relationship with him. Danger of paganism surrounded by a, a culture that doesn't respect God and a mix-up of religious groups and folks and names and creeds and traditions. And the church needs to be in the world and not the world in the church. Tolerance. Well, hey, maybe everything's okay. Let's just sort of go along, get along, make the best of our situation. And, of course, contamination. Deuteronomy, as all the Old Testament, warns about relationships, not entering into marriages, for example, that would take them away from their allegiance to the Lord God. Contamination coming into God's people. So here we are. Chapter 1. But before we do that, I'd like to ask if you have another comment about why you love the book of Deuteronomy or something you want me to uh, discuss a little bit further. Okay. All right. So we might kind of look at this in terms of where the events take place as we open up the book. Uh, Moses. Yes, Greg. Please. That's okay. Okay. The past is repeated if we don't learn from our mistakes. It fits us today like a glove fits a hand, doesn't it? You read it and you say, wow, we need to preach it. We need to believe it. We need to live it. We need to let the world see it. Good. Did I miss anybody else? Okay, so I think we've talked about this first part, 40th year. Um, if we were to look at the map, Horeb, which is what Deuteronomy calls Mount Sinai, from there to Kadesh Barnea, could be made in 11 days. But think about that short, relatively short distance of 150 miles, but then why can't we get home? Why can't we get home? Because of sin, price of disobedience, the uh, determination that these people are giants. We can't capture them. We better go back to Egypt and look at the cost. Sihon and Og, do you know these names? They appear over and over and over. I'll give you the number of occurrences in a moment. Here it is. So as Israel's traveling through, Sihon 
the king of the Heshbon comes out and, and, and Moses says, can we just go through your land? We will t stay on the road. We'll buy your food and your drink. We won't harass you. We won't fight you. And Sihon says, no, I'm going to take you out. So he gets all his king's men, all the king's people, and, and, and goes against Israel. Well, God intervenes, and Sihon is overthrown. Then you have the same thing with Og. I call him Og, the king of the Amorites. He, he won't let them go through. So from that point on, these two become the proof and the guarantee that God can take out any enemy that Israel faces. And so constantly remember Sihon and Og and what God did to them. And don't fear, be confident, um, have the full assurance of victory and go into this new land. Anyone that tries to stop you will end up like those two did. So then you have uh, this prologue, the command to leave Mount Sinai, and we can hear these words. You've been here long enough. <laughs> Don't waste your time. Don't keep running in circles. Get up and get moving. That makes me think of Involvement Sunday. We've been on hold to some extent with the pandemic. A lot of good things have continued, but this is a new, fresh day. And then organization. You need to appoint and structure your leaders. And Moses said, I can't carry all of you by myself. You may remember Jethro, his father-in-law, in Exodus 18. So you need to divvy this up and have some other people at various levels uh, assisting you with uh, matters that require uh, judges and so forth. So look at chapter 1 with me. Verse 3, you'll see it's the 40th year. Uh, verse 4, Sihon of the Amorites, and who lived in Heshbon, and Og of Bashan, and then Moses begins speaking. Notice he goes back to the past about uh, the Lord speaking to us at Horeb. And you need to turn your feet. The land is before you, verse 8. God swore it to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's not going to renege or fail in what he said he would do. And so uh, the Lord has multiplied you like the stars of heaven. That's what he told Abraham he would do. And he's going to increase you a thousandfold more. But I can't carry the burden of you and your strife. So choose wise and discerning and experienced men from your tribes. I will appoint them as your heads. These are three marks of leadership. Wisdom, discernment, and experience. I'm going to preach in a few minutes about movers and shakers. There's so many people among us that are just like these individuals that would be chosen to help get the rest of us motivated and active. So he appointed them over various groups, thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. And then I charged your judges. Uh, not show partiality. Treat the small and the great alike. Don't fear a man. Judgment belongs to God. If a case is too hard, Bring it to me. Thoughts that you have, this first part of the chapter, anybody? All right, don't, yeah, okay, yes, sir. It takes a village, go ahead, to make things happen. That's right. That's right. You can't make it without leaders, but can't, leaders can't lead without Followers. Somebody says, is it true it takes a village? Yes, but let me choose the village, right? And God has chosen the church as the village uh, in which these things take place. Good. All right. You know, it tells you again that we don't all have the same talents. Some can manage smaller things, some larger things. You know, uh, don't bother Moses, let's say, with all the rather petty or trivial or minor things, if you can handle it, handle it. And I think that's true, too. If you see a hole, fill it. If you see a need, take care of it. If you see something that's lacking, uh, jump in there. And uh, we shouldn't expect uh, our elders, for example, we should, shouldn't expect all of our leaders to take responsibility for everything that each person on his own could do. That's a good point. Anybody? 
All right, I keep hoping to be interrupted. I'm kind of watching here. Okay, so uh, now we get to Kadesh Barnea. And again, he's going back to the story that they've heard for 40 years. What is it? Those spies. Ay, 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 ay. Why did we do what we did? And do we have to hear it again? So let me ask you the question. What's the value of repeating things that everybody already knows? Especially failures from the past. Why does the Bible stress so much about reminding and retelling and reciting, Cherry? Right. If you don't learn from the mistakes of history, you're doomed to repeat them. So that's the whole book of Deuteronomy, isn't it, Cherry? Don't do what your fathers did. Don't fall into that trap. Yes. Verse 21, please. Yes. Well, but let's go back, uh, Numbers 13, 1 and 2. The Lord said to Moses, send out for yourself men that they may spy out for the land, which I'm going to give. This is uh, Numbers 13, 1 and 2, but, but you've got to choose your spies carefully, don't you? Don't, you've got to, you know, don't, don't pick those that vacillate or that weak or compromise, but pick people that will, you know, move you forward, people that will put their eyes on the Lord and see things from his point of view. Oh, that's, oh, that's okay. okay. That's okay. I, I, I check myself. myself. You're great. <laughs> that's, that's the way we all uh, figure things out yeah. by looking. Good. Anybody else? else? What's, What's that? that? Iron sharpens iron. iron. That's why we have a study like, like this. this. That's, that's right. right. You, yes. Yeah, yeah, Jim. Go ahead. But even though they, they sent those spies into the world, yes. yes. Only, Only two. two. That's right. Uh-uh. Good. Good. You know, the, uh, Jim says you don't always know exactly how a person will handle an assignment until you give it to them. And then you see what they're really made of. You know, the Bible says in 1 Timothy 3 that before deacons are appointed, they must first be what? Tested. Let them first be tested. So there are tests for leaders that they must pass before you give them something, but you still don't know when you put them in this role and, and the stakes are higher, right, Jim? And then they're got to go against their own peers. Here you've got 12 men and 10 are saying, no, 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 no. And it's so tempting just to be silent, kind of flow with the crowd. Lynn. Right. 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 Some of these people, Lynn says, would have been very young at Mount Sinai. I mean, they were born during this time, but maybe they were uh, church babies at that time. You know, they were present and contributing with their own noises, but not perceiving and not understanding. And then as they grow up, they would have heard this. Now, Joshua and Caleb are still alive. They will enter the land. And Moses is still, at this point, will find uh, his death at the end of Deuteronomy. David?
Always the grumblers, yes. Naysayers. Right. That's the way they left Egypt. Came out grumbling. Yep. Right. Yes. That's right. You know, to me, that's why God says, work out your own salvation. Yes. yes. Work, work out your own salvation, salvation Philippians 2, two with, with fear and trembling. Yes. Yeah, individual choice. For each generation. Passing the torch in each individual person. Good. Someone said we should let the past refine us but not define us. Anybody else? Yes, David. They've heard all this before. They could preach the sermon. Yes. Yes, it's true. That's right. At 18, yes, the word hasn't changed. But as we grow older, we, we see more depth. You know, I'm preaching this series, The Week That Changed the World. I preached a similar sermon series back in 2014. And I've had at least two people come to me and say, I remember you preached on it. And one of them said, I still have the notes in my Bible. Oh, well, that's pretty good. So uh, I try to refresh and renew and recreate things, but there are times to go back and say, we need to hear this again. Yes? Also, I can't help but think of young David who thought within himself yes. to do what God wanted him to do. Yes, yes. The king said, uh-uh. The king. Yeah. I don't think this is going to work. Right. He steps forward with his little bag of rocks. That's right. That's right. The battle belongs to the Lord. Young, young David. And here's Saul, reneges, here the army, uh, David's own brothers, his older brothers, castigate him, criticize him. What are you just trying to get in on the action here? And David said, give me my sling, give me my rocks. Yeah. That's right. Never sell ourselves short. Thank you. Yes, Donna. If God is for us, who can be against us? Where do we read that? Romans 8, 31 to 39. Uh, the scripture says there, Donna, he that justified us, who could condemn us? If God saved us, who could cause us to be lost as long as we keep our faith? You know, uh, neither uh, height or depth or angels or life or uh, principalities or sword, nothing can separate us from his love. Good. Yes. Yes, 2 Peter 1. Yes. Verse 13. I'm going to stir you up by way of remembrance as long as I'm still in this body, as long as I'm still moving. And he said, I want to be sure that after I'm gone, you won't forget what I've told you. And so that's with our children. Drill it and drill it and drill it so that they're saturated like a sponge with the things of God. Greg? Yes, you are going to. Yes, yes. And isn't that interesting, Greg, how he could tell them of their future failure, and they do it anyway. You know, it's like he's telling Simon Peter, you're going to deny me three times. No, 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 no. And even though he had been told, so much warning for us. Yes. Yes. Yeah, unworthy servants. And that's why we need to strengthen our faith. Every day, like a faith builder's class like this. We all need it. Yes. Peter, yeah. yeah. We think of apostles as perfect. They couldn't. Yes. 
That's another one. Elders, elders deacons, deacons, ministers, ministers right. right. Peter was both of them. That's yeah. right. Peter was, was an apostle and an elder. Peter, Peter pursued his faith on multiple That's, That's right. right. No, I'm not going to do that. You're, you're not going, going to die. die. That's, That's right. right. That's right. Yeah, Look, Look where, where Peter, Peter stands today. today. As, that's that's right. right. Good. So, so we can we put relative, relative confidence in our leaders. And, and those of us who lead want to be above reproach, we want to be blameless, etc. But, but no one, one should put our ultimate trust in any human being. And the Bible speaks to that. Okay, okay remember the presumption. Uh, we talked about in chapter 40 of Numbers where when they realize they're going to be punished for their unbelief, they say, no, no, we can fix this. Let's take and let's go and let's attack. And Moses said, no, 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 no. So we said, "There's on the one hand, you didn't do what God told you to when he said to. Now you're going to do something that God has not authorized. He's not sending you. He wouldn't have you. We're going to go anywhere. We're going to, we're going to, we're going to fix this. And so that's the sin of presumption. It's going over the boundary uh, as the opposite of failing to move forward. So chapter 2, here we're going to come through uh, Seir, where Edom, the descendants of Esau, live. Remember, Edom means red because he said, give me some of that red stuff there when he traded his birthright to his brother. And uh, Moses tells the people, they'll fear you. Be careful. They know that you're this great horde, this army, this um, you know, large mass of people. So you buy food from them and drink. Don't expect anything. Don't take any of their land. Interesting. God says, I've given this land to them. In Deuteronomy, God says, don't touch that land or that land. So uh, then Moab. You may remember the tragedy of Lot with his two daughters, right? From that, you have the Moabites and the Ammonites. And so, similar, God has made provisions for them, even though they're not Israel. Now we come to King Sihon. 37 times he's in the Bible. You talk about repetition. Let me say that again, repetition. So that you can't forget every Israelite knew this name, Sihon. He's mentioned more than a host of other Israelites in the Bible. So Moses offers to go through. I think I've mentioned this earlier. Uh, Sihon refuses, and so the war goes on, and he and his people are utterly destroyed. You come to 3, chapter 3. Og. Here's that other one I mentioned. Uh, Amorite king, 22 times he's named, did the same thing. And then in chapter 3, you have kind of review of the Transjordanian land that is across the Jordan that's been conquered. Interesting about Og is that he was a giant. And look at your Bible and see, does it mention Og's bedstead in your Bible? Bedstead? Okay, do you have another word besides bedstead? Iron bedstead? Okay, the, the same Hebrew word can refer to a place where you're, where you're laid down, where you're resting. Could be a couch, could even be a coffin. Very interesting. Because notice how wide it is. It's hard to imagine an og was six and a half feet wide. So it's possible that you could go today and visit um, uh, his coffin. Or it's possible it was his bed and it was just huge. But think of a man that tall uh, so if God took him down, hey, why would you be afraid of the Anakim, the Rephaim, the Nephilim, and the other Eames, by the way, the other Hebrew Eames, the tall people in this new land? Look what happened to him. So the land we talked about before is allotted to Reuben and Gad and Manasseh. They will go across the Jordan and help their fellow Hebrews conquer where they're going to settle but they're allowed to leave their own cattle and their little ones in the land on the east side of the Jordan uh, uh, before they do that. Further war efforts are still required. And so as with Sihon and Og, so it will be with all. Moses, you can see the land, but you can't enter it. And Moses says, the Lord was angry with me. Why? On your account. 
We talked about this before. In fact, Tanya is teaching the fourth and fifth graders this morning about Eli. We talked about Eli and his sons and the fact that they were responsible because they disobeyed God as priests, but their father Eli had also failed to correct them. So this matter of shared responsibility. Moses lost his temper. He flew off the handle. Shall we draw water for you rebels? Moses was wrong. Yet the people provoked him. They pushed him. They annoyed him and irritated him. So they also have part of the blame. And I think I've mentioned before, I see this all the way through the Bible, that sometimes there are things that happen in which various parties were factors in a decision made, good or bad, we should say good things that happened, not because of just one individual, but because of many contributors. Have we mentioned today's involvement Sunday? You might say, okay, okay, all right. Any other thoughts on chapter three? Yes, sir. Where he hit the rock, yes. He was so frustrated, yes, yes. He was at the breaking point, wasn't he, Greg? That's right, we're not crushed. Anybody ever hear the old expression, the devil made me do it? Can the devil make you do anything? No, can he play a part? Yes. Uh, Paul speaks to the Corinthians and the Thessalonians, he says, Satan hindered us. And he says in 2 Corinthians 12, I received this thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, to bruise me, to beat me up. So there again, shared responsibility. Satan can tempt, he can entice, he can attract, but unless we are attracted, unless we are interested, unless we are willing, Satan cannot have his way with us. So be on guard, he's like a roaring lion seeking someone to eat for lunch. Did we mention the potluck? No. Okay. Okay. Good, good comments. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay, okay, someone asked me, maybe after class last week, uh, you know, Moses, this one slip up, so to speak, and yet he couldn't enter the promised land. What about that? And God is God, and the consequences of sin, he determines. There are other cases in the Bible where uh, it seems like God acts very strongly, very quickly, very decisively. But we also have to remember that Moses is in the real promised land. Is that right? Because he appeared with Jesus at the Mount of Transfiguration in Matthew 17. He's commended all the way through the New Testament. So he may have missed it here, but he didn't miss it there. And between the two, you know where Moses would ultimately want to be. I saw a hand back here. Is it Lynn? Chapter 3:22. The Lord is the one fighting for you. Good. He is always faithful. Very good. So look at verse 21 again. Your eyes have seen all that the Lord your God has done to these two kings. Who are the two kings? You guys, you'll never forget Sihon and Og, will you? We sometimes, there's a fancy name for that, historical solidarity. That what God has done previously, you can count on God to do again. He is the one fighting for you. Good. Yes, sir. Yes. God knows everything. We don't. Yes, right. He tells us what we need to know. Secret things belong to him, and the revealed things belong to us. And sometimes it's better, isn't it, Greg, that we don't know uh, some things that God knows. Okay, so Deuteronomy 4, here are some reasons to obey. Because you're going to face these idols, and they're going to be on every side, and people will, again, try to pull you into their paganism or to complacency or compromise or tolerance. So number one reason to obey is what? You want to live? Here's a good plan. Look at verse 1. That you may live 
and go in and take possession of the land. Remember verse 2, don't add to or take from. That warning is found numerous times in Scripture. Stick with the Word of God. Don't substitute. Don't weaken it. Simply obey it. Yeah, the Pharisees adding to their traditions, their oral rules, and yes, so forth. Okay, verses 5 through 8. What's the second reason? Verse 6, that's your wisdom, your understanding. And other people will look at Israel and say, this is a great nation. Same is true for the church. Not that we want ourselves to be applauded, but people say, that church is on fire for the Lord Jesus Christ. Look how God is guiding them and using them. Number three, the past. Mount Sinai. Look at verses 9 to 14. Remember Horeb. Uh, you came near. Uh, verse 11. The mountain burned with fire, darkness, cloud, thick gloom. The Lord spoke and he gave you the Ten Commandments. Verse 13. Uh, Hebrew, by the way, simply says the ten words. Ten words. I think every English Bible says commandments. Two tablets of stone. Okay, verse 15, God's ownership. Horeb was the past, but you belong to him now, and that is today. Watch yourself carefully. Don't act corruptly. Make a graven image. Don't make any likeness. This is huge. Don't worship the sun and the moon and the stars and the host of heaven, verse 19, because why? God saved you. He brought you out of the iron Furnace. He was angry with me on your account. He said that. I will die, but you will go on. Watch yourselves. Look at verse 24. The Lord your God is a consuming fire, a jealous God. You read that anywhere in the New Testament? Hebrews 12 quotes this verse. Our God is a consuming fire. Therefore, worship him with reverence and awe, not casually or lightly, in a sense not comfortably. Because he's a consuming fire. Okay, you want to keep the land, 25 to 31. You need to obey. And then finally, 32 to 40, God's unique character. I'm going to move on so we get through chapter 5, and I'll see if we can take a comment. God is God. There is no other like him. And so for that reason, remember uh, the danger that can come if you disobey. And then the end of chapter 4, the cities of refuge, where a manslayer we might call not premeditated first-degree murder, could go and, and, and be safe uh, for a time. And then introduction to the law. Chapter 5, the re repetition of the commandments as in Exodus 20. And this is for us, not just those that have died, but today. And the people's response, oh, there's a consuming fire, Hebrews 12. 29. And they say, oh, we'll hear, we'll obey. Just like uh, Greg was mentioning. Oh, well, yeah. Warning, warning, warning. Oh, we're not going to fall in that trap. Uh, and then the Lord gives the affirmation. I like verse 29. Oh, that they had such a heart in them that they would fear me and keep all my commandments always that it may be well with them and their sons forever. So the people then go back to their tents and Moses returns to receive the entire law. Now, go ahead, David. I was going to go back to chapter 4. Chapter 4, 20, 27 to 30. Good. Yes, yes. This time and that time, parallel. You'll be scattered. You will perish. You'll be exiled. Yes. Good. That's right. That's where it is. Yes. 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 We can find him if we search for him. Remember Paul said, in him we live and move and have our being. He is not far from us. 
Good. So uh, David's noted that we're scattered in the sense of dispersed. Christians, we're to be salt. Someone said they've got to get the salt out of the shaker if it's going to do any good. And we are light. Uh, and also here in Deuteronomy 4 is that warning. You're going to disobey me. You're going to be exiled to another land. That's the rest of the Old Testament. You'll cry out to God and he will bring you back. All right, well, our time is about up. So thank you for being with us, and we'll pick up here next Lord's Day.